Um, let's start. We have a. I think we're going to have a really cool class. Well, uh, the cool the coolness level of the class will completely depend on you. So, if it's lame, it's because you're lame. It has nothing to do with me. So, uh, all right. So listen. Here's where we're at. We're going to talk about solutions today. So we've been talking about inequality and lots of issues that go along with that and how to think about it and how to move forward in different ways. But today I want to talk about see, if, see what you think about solutions. And I've never done this. I haven't done this. I, haven't, I, I never do any class the way I do any. I, every class is different. So, But this class, I realized I woke up today and I said, you know what, I have no idea what you think about this. So I really just want to hear from you all how you frame it and how you would make the argument for what we need to do. And I have five, I'm going to start with five slides. And also, let me say, uh, hey, can you put me on yellow for a second? So people watching the stream today is a really good day. If you have a camera to VTC in. So just say something in the chat room and Jeff will latch on to you. And if you have a question or a comment, today's a good day for that. Okay. We have a camera set up. We're ready to go. So here, here's how we're going to do. You are going to, um, I'm going to give you five slides. And as we start talking, as we start a class conversation, I want you to keep the five slides in mind. The first is, remember, choice and chance, freedom determinism. Life is rooted in choices that people make and factors and forces outside of their control. So you can make the best choices, the most amazing choices. I know people in Haiti, for example, who are absolutely brilliant entrepreneurs. I can go, there is a street in Haiti where I can take my broken cell phone and some 10-year-old kid with tools that I have no idea where he got these tools, but they are not Apple verified tools trust me and he sits on a on, he's sitting on a tire in a on the side of a muddy street and no shoes on no shirt on just a kid in his shorts 10 years old give him my phone he pops it open he puts a new face on because the face is broken and fixes something else in the phone and gives it back to me and I give him a couple of bucks and I go on my way and how does that kid know how to fix an iPhone and that kid is brilliant and not only can he just fix the glass in the iPhone but he can fix other pieces of the iPhone and how is that and who would that kid be if he had the opportunities that many of you had here in your lives and then to come to a place like Penn State let's say and study engineering and I can tell you of stories all over the world of people who, and in the United States, people who are amazingly brilliant, but because of factors and forces outside of their control, will never walk up this ladder of upward mobility. It just is not going to happen. And other people who are born at the top and who are going to stay at the top, and they're dullards and dumb. And like, how is that? But then there are choices, right? And some people make amazing choices and maybe this 10 year old kid in Haiti will just be so insightful and he'll work his way through and he'll figure out how to get a, a, a scholarship and then a visa and how to meet the right people and he'll just make these choices and just he's one in, a, one in 10 thousand chance but he'll do it so those two things got to go together second this there is so much inequality in the United States and in the world so much inequality just um, unbelievable. And look at, look at, so we, we looked at this, right? Look who's just controlling the wealth. It's like, it's just like, ah, okay, how, got it? So hold that. How do you address that? How do we rectify it? What do we do? Should we do it? And if so, why should we do it? What's this about? And you might be somewhere in here, or here and just be like, well, I don't know, maybe we don't do anything, or maybe you're just feeling lazy today, so you don't even have an opinion, but come on, man. But if you're down here, you're going to have an opinion about it, because that's how it is. And second, take a look at this, median household wealth. Look, so here we are, this is more or less today, I mean, we're in 2019, but we're sort of here. So the red, this is, this is median household wealth. 
Okay? So the red is black, black people, black Americans. The black is Hispanic Americans. Blue is Asian Americans. And I think, I think this is green is white Americans. So here we are about here. Look at the inequality. Look where we were here. Look at how it's grown. And look at how it's gone for Hispanics and blacks in the U.S. Native Americans on here. Look where it's going. This is 2043. That's where we're going, my friends. You got it? So it's like, wow. Look, look, this is what black Americans, Hispanic Americans can expect. That's the growth of median household wealth. And here it is for white people and Asians. And Asians, again, it's a little different. It's different because 65% of people who identify as Asian in the United States are immigrants. And they're immigrants, a by far and away disproportionate number of Asian immigrants come with college educations or, or with enough money to go to college. And increasingly being pushed toward the, the STEM fields and where you're going to make more money. And why? Because that's, those are the people who are coming. And those are the people who are getting visas. And people who are professionals and doctors and architects and so on and so forth, right? People who are not are back home. So we're seeing a very disproportionate number of Asians relative to other immigrant groups at any point in U.S. history who are highly educated. And that's how Asians can go from here. And look at how the tech boom and the professionalization just allows Asians to take off. Okay? Got it? So look at this. Look at this. This is where we're going. Look, look at that. Come on, man. Money makes money. Next one. Take it, college is worth less if you're raised poor. Wait, by the way, can we go back here? Can, can I just say something about this? You know, I always have this, I have this thing that I do. It's sort of like, you know, like uh, king of the mountain. And, you know, when you, when you start, when you get to the top, it's a lot easier to stay on top. You ever play, do you know what king of the mountain game is? Like, where you try to, boys play it a lot. You sort of try to get up on top of the mountain and... Do you know, you, it's a lot of times it's just, sometimes it's the strongest person who gets to the top of the hill or whatever, and sometimes it's just chance, but someone gets to the top of the hill, and then whoever gets to the top, they're up on top, and then the other people have to chase them and try to throw them off. But whoever is the first person that got up there, you have the leverage because you can use your feet to be kicking other people off. So whoever's first to get up, and sometimes it's just chance that you got up first, it's a lot easier to stay on top. And we see this here. You just stay on top, man. We, you know, you use money. So the other day, we're talking about the stairs. And if you're in the group who's more likely to be higher on the stairs, you can just use whatever you need. You can make the laws. You can make the rules. You can make all the decisions that you need to ensure that your group stays more on top. And which is what we see. Slavery was over in the U.S. in 1865. But in 1866... The, the U.S. had a whole host of laws in place to ensure that black Americans were not going to come up this ladder. This is not possible. So people up here just made the decisions to ensure that they stayed up there. And we see it with Native Americans. We see it with Latinos and Hispanics. We just see it again and again. We saw it with Asian Americans. If we go back here earlier in time. Okay? Next one. Here, college is worth light. Look at this. So you go to college and you work hard and you do what you got to do and, you know, then that's where it is. College is the place to go to ensure that, you know, you can get a, a sort of a foothold on the ladder of upward mobility. So look here, this is the age. So annual earnings by education and parents' income, okay? So if you, your parents are poor, the blue is parents are, okay? So here it is. Parents are poor, and you have a high school degree. This is your earnings, okay? And if you have a high school degree and your parents are not poor, this is your expected earnings at the age of 61. This was done just a few years ago, okay? Now, if your parents are not poor and you get a BA degree, this, is, these would, this would be your expected earnings by the age of 61. And if your parents are poor and you have a BA degree, these are your expected earnings. So look at this. So your parents, if your parents are poor and you have a high school degree, if your parents are not poor and you have a high school degree, you're going to, on average, make more than if your parents are poor. 
And if your parents are not poor and you have a college degree, you're going to make a lot more money than people who have the same college degree as you, but their parents are poor. So that means in this classroom, look, on average, you can study the same things. You can go take the same classes, do the same thing that your classmates do, and if your classmates who are wealthier, on average, 20 years from now, in this room, just this room, are going to make a lot more money than you are going to make if you're, parent, if you're coming from a poor household. You have the same degree, the same grades, the same everything. That's what these data show. So we know this is happening. What the fuck? Okay, what do we do? Next one, right? So here, we know there's discrimination. And I don't mean we just ask people, have you been discriminated against, right? Four out of 10 Hispanics in the United States say, yes, they've experienced discrimination. But that doesn't mean anything until we really boil it down. So here's one. This dude who used to be here at Penn State in the social department, he carefully crafted these resumes for just, you know, people who had degrees in psychology and sociology and so on. And he sent them out. And, the, and he wanted to test. Whether, you know, there's discrimination. Hang on, I'm going to come back at this one second. He wanted to test whether, you know, we know there's discrimination if you, if you get two equal candidates and they graduate from a place like Penn State. But what if you graduate from the elite schools? Stanford, Harvard, Yale, Princeton. What if you graduate from these schools and you get a degree? You, anybody, we would imagine, is going to want somebody with a, a degree from one of the elite schools. So he said, let me just test this and see. Because, and, he's, and he was only looking at black people. And he said, We're, I'm going to carefully craft these resumes and I'm going to send people out for these jobs. I'm going to send these resumes out and I'm going to see what kind of responses we get. And the only difference in the resumes... The only way he could signify whether people were white or black is just change the names. So black names were like, it doesn't mean everybody with, a, with these names are black, but it's a signifier, right? I mean, he used the census to do this. Jalen, Lamar, Daquan, Nia, Ebony. I don't know any white people named Ebony, honestly. And Sharnice, okay? And for white names, that's Caleb, Charlie, and I know a black dude named Charlie, but whatever. Ronnie, Aubrey, Erica, Leslie. Tend to be white names. And here's what he finds. He finds these are responses to the job applications. So when people graduated from Duke, Stanford, Harvard, they were white applicants. They were with white-sounding names. They got a 17.5% response rate. The exact same resume. The exact same resume, but with a different name. Got a 12.9%. And these are the state colleges, like Penn State. Okay? And here are their responses. So look, the black applicants, only if, they go, if you go to Duke, Harvard, Stanford, etc., you only do a little better than if you go to a place like Penn State. So look, this is, dude, you can't argue this. This is like, this is like solid, standing in cement discrimination. This isn't even, this is just calling getting a response. This isn't even getting a job. You still gotta go in and do the interview. So this is just a given that we see everywhere we look for these kinds of things, this is what we see. So, got it? So let's look at again what we have. We have the, the, the origin of, of the reality that we're looking at. Is it, is it freedom, determinism, choice, chance? You gotta account for both things. We have just wealth inequality. We have wealth inequality by race, which is pretty substantial. White people. Not all white people, right? Because remember Taylor the other day. Got it? Then we have the ability to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and do what we're supposed to do. And yet... We see the inequality here. And then we have discrimination. What are we looking at? Okay? So my question is then, what are the solutions? What do we do? And by the way, don't forget, if you have a comment or a question, we're ready, Jeff's ready for it. So what do we do?
what do you do? I'm assuming that, you know, you can make the argument, well, we don't do anything. Just kind of let things go as they go. And, okay, yeah, that's fine, right? That's, that's really easy to say. But that's sort of like, you know, you can say, well, just let things go as they go and it's all good and I don't know, there's nothing you really can do so we don't do anything. All right, well then, let's say I come along and I steal your cell phone. It's like, oh, well, whatever, you just lost your cell phone. So now I got your, I got, oh, so I have her cell phone. And she, it's, it's mine now. And you say, well, that's not fair. Well, neither is any of this fair. How is it fair that the person that starts out on top just automatically makes so much more and more and more and does more and has more opportunities just because you happen to be randomly born into some family? And then the family that along with all the other families is using power and wealth and all their decision making and just to pass laws to ensure that they stay up on top and everybody else stays on the bottom so other people don't compete with their kids. And then let's say I take your cell phone and I give it to my kids. So then this is a special cell phone. So your kids don't have it. My kids do. Then my kids start using this cell phone to get really rich. And then my kids' kids continue to do that. And it all was because back on this day in April, in 2019, I stole somebody's cell phone and passed it on to my progeny and then my people and my group. And they all did really, really well. And then you're, you're going to be stuck down here or even down there. Because I stole something. Well, that's essentially what's happened. We're stealing, right? It's just part of it. A lot of stuff was stolen from lots of people. Stolen land from Native Americans. Stolen labor from black Americans. Like who, what do you, how rich, come on man. Seriously? Have you ever like sat back? Has, have anybody in here ever sat back and thought about how wealthy the United States is because of that period of time called slavery that got free labor from people, from a, a, a massive, really large population of people, and how that just continues. So anyway, so what do we do? What are we supposed to do, right? You got to have some kind of opinion on it. So um, we're going to walk around with a few microphones. Let's go. Like, what do you do? What are the solutions? What are solutions? I, want, I just want to hear, I, there's no right answer or wrong answer. I really just want to hear what you're thinking. Solutions. Any, let's go. Kick it out. You don't have to, you can stay in your seats to do this. But what are you thinking? What do you do? Do we just, all right, Mom. Proper tax collection. What's that? Proper tax collection. What's that? Proper tax collection. Proper, ah, proper tax collection. What would that mean? So what do you mean? Say more. So according to the city from IRS, IRS in America, there is about $125 billion that are not collected from the businesses. So you would say you got to do a better, we have to do a better job of collecting more taxes from really wealthy people. Yeah. Who you think are not paying their fair share? It, it would help to distribute the wealth throughout the country, I think. Okay, it would help distribute the wealth. All right, but wealthy people are the ones that are making the decisions, so they also right. don't like that. Because why don't they like it? Because they're take, getting their money taken away. Yeah, that, and, they, and, they need, and they're investing the money to create jobs and stuff, so they come up with all their arguments for why that's a bad idea. But, okay, but you would start right there. All right, man. Cool. Somebody else. What, what else? What would you say? What else, man? Where are we going to go? Give me, give, give, come up with some stuff. Like, what, what are you going to do? Yes. Somebody over here, just raise your hand. We're just throwing, we're just popcorning. We're, we're just getting a conversation going. Get, Lauren, right there, that dude on the end, blue shirt. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I think the people that have um, very low incomes should be taught how to be more creative than being discouraged all the time, with, bombarded with facts that they can't make it or anything like that. They should just be taught to be more creative um, and 
try to get out of the situations. That okay, so you're saying people should just, all, what we really need to do is just tell people, hey, just be more creative in how you get out of situations, right? Which, okay, which is, all right, that's cool. But so you're talking also about people down here. So you're saying just continue to empower people at the bottom. That's all you can do. So what about when people up here just keep shutting, putting walls up to people at the bottom, right? Like, for example, immigrants coming to the United States right now. So, you know, I spent a lot of time in Latin America in communities that have been decimated by poverty. And people come to the United States. And, like, I remember when you are a parent and you, you know, like, talking. I remember the first time I watched a person die were these, this couple who brought, I was with a priest in Ecuador, and they brought their child to the priest, just hoping that beyond hope that he could do something. And the child died right in their arms as we we're standing there. I'm like, oh my God. And so what he did was say last rites. And then shortly after that, the guy left for the United States because he didn't want his other children to die. Okay? So he's encouraged to some level. Hey, go do that. Go make that happen. And yet now here we are up here in all of our wisdom. Oh, we can't let all these people come in. And every single one of us would be that same person. And if we knew that person, we'd be like, wow, oh my God, I can't believe that. If that was my child, I'd do anything I had to do. But yet we're like closing walls up. So we can be creative. Like, hey, man, get, I don't know, swim around the wall. Like they build a wall, swim around it or get more education or do this or do that. And maybe that's the only thing we can do. Fuck, I don't know. Yeah, that's a good point. All right, bro. Just turn it on. Just push it up. You're good. Gotcha. Um, so probably policies that reduce individual debt, like uh, Medicare for All and universal uh, public higher education. Okay, so that's more of a socialist idea, right? So what you do is you're saying take tax money that we all contribute. Everyone in this class can, pays a tax, right? And you, so you take some of that money. We we'll all pay a little bit, right? Like so let's say our tuition dollars is like a tax. Let's say we all pay the same amount. And then what we do is we take some of those tuition dollars and give it to the poorest among us who really struggle the most to you know, pay for health care or pay for anything that they need and then give it to them to ensure that they have sort of a basic level of the ability to study, let's say, right? Sure. Something like that. Yeah. Okay, so there's a socialist perspective. Okay, so... Somebody else want to say something? Are you all socialists in here? You want to just go with that? Is that cool? You good with that? Yeah, go ahead, bro. Uh, yeah, discussing on like the chance and uh, choice thing, I think sometimes there's more factors that aren't, I don't think have really been a, a addressed in this class. Like I think one thing that greatly determines how successful you are in basically everything from poverty to you know dropping out of high school or crime is fatherlessness and it's on the rise in pretty much every community especially in some and it um, has a great impact on you know those parents mm -hmm. um, you know setting up their children to be statistically less successful all right so here's the thing right so it's, it's, it's single parenthood, actually, because even when it's, it's fathers who are raising children by themselves, it's the same thing. It's similar. It's single parenthood. Split right? families. So if you go back to the conversation that Chenjirai and I had when he was in class, and we looked at, for example, the rise of the drug war in the, the early, in the, in the, first off, 19, early 1970s, and then the early 1980s, and then the late 80s and early 90s, those like three blips of the drug war, when we're just going after, like, you know, we're not going after big pharma, we're going after people in, in certain communities in particular, okay? And 
Then if we look at, for example, let me take the black community and black families in the United States, right? Where we look at the, the increase in the number of black men being thrown in prison for victimless crimes like smoking marijuana, right? We're not talking about being major drug dealers. We're talking about smoking marijuana or smoking crack. And we're not talking about smoking crack and then going out and robbing people. We're just talking about smoking crack versus white people, much more of a white thing, snorting coke, right? Very different thing. And although I've done both, but I'm different. All right. So now you got like these two things. Then we see the rise in arresting particularly black men at the bottom half of the socioeconomic ladder. Okay. And then we see the rise in black women having babies out of wedlock. And the two go hand in hand such that now we look at the very large number of black men in prison and it matches almost perfectly with the number of black men um, who or the number of black women who are having children out of wedlock. Meaning that, look, well, of course you have children out of wedlock. You've got these policies that are just really just really blatantly racist and unfair, right? Really. And so then we got this rise of single parents, especially black women having kids. And so, okay, but we can't blame it on black women having kids, like making choices, right? I mean, we can, but there are still choices, right? It's like human beings, just like I chose not to wear a dress today, and many of you chose, I'm looking around the room at all the women who have straight hair, who would say, like, yeah, I'm choosing to wear my hair straight. And I'm like, motherfuckers, you didn't even wear your hair straight 15 years ago. None of my students had straight hair. And suddenly you're like, oh, I'm choosing to have straight hair. It's like, no, you're not. And so nor are women just choosing suddenly to have children out of wedlock when, of course, we know. They, I mean, they are and they're not. They'd be choosing. Like, you're, you chose your straight hair. You really did, right? You could curl it. But it's sort of like, or you, or whatever the case is, right? But, like, you didn't. So this is, that's the problem with that. You know what I mean? So you're saying that one in four children in America has a parent in prison? No, no, we're only talking about the number of kids who are born out of wedlock. It's higher than one in four, by the way. The number of black, the number of black babies in the United States that are born out of wedlock is higher than one in four, right? Maybe. And so what it is, it's the number of black men who are con not in prison, who are connected to the, to the, um, to the uh, justice system, either a been in prison, been arrested, been on parole, or are on parole, or are arrested, or are in prison, one or the other, right? And it's just immensely high, and you're connected. And on top of that is joblessness, and it's just like, fuck, man. So if we had equity, that wouldn't happen. It's just like, it doesn't happen. Human beings are basically the same, but nonetheless, that's a, the degree to which it does, though, don't have a child out of wedlock, man. Come on, man. Fucking use birth control. Like, Jesus. It's caught, you know what I mean? Like, like, it's really cheap. If you can't afford a condom, I'll buy one for you, for crying out loud. But it's 50 cents. It's expensive to have a kid. So, yeah. So, I'm with you there. Right? For sure. But it's like, you got to just like, we take things. Everything is connected to something else. But, yeah, that's fair. That's fair to say. Uh, I think it's also important to note for the middle and lower classes in the modern era with pharmacy lobbying and stuff like that, politicians tend to go with it because they're not educated on, you know, what might happen uh, if they don't. So then you see, like, in 2015, the case of uh, the one guy that used AIDS treatment and spiked the price over $3,000. Yeah. So you're seeing people that are affected by different diseases and stuff. Um, the wealth can afford it, but the lower classes can't pay for these medications. So in turn, you see medicine getting more expensive and more and more people not being able to find treatment. Okay, so you would say, once again, so what you're saying is take... So he, what he's saying is, look, we could do all sorts of things socialistically, but, it does, but while we're doing all that, talk to individuals and be like, dude, don't make a stupid decision. Like, for example... If you have a, if you have a, uh, your pack back assignment due on Sunday night and you're, you've already missed a few of them and you're trying to keep your grades up because you want to get into your major, then don't be an idiot and forget to do it. It's like put it in your phone and do it. And if you are an idiot and you forget to do it, then like whatever. Nobody can help you and you shouldn't get into your major because you shouldn't even be in college. 
I wouldn't want to hire you. And same thing, it's like don't be an idiot and use birth control if you can. And yet there's a lot of other factors and forces that go into that. Like why you might not do your pack back assignment. I don't know. So you're going with the more socialist approach. And like, okay. I mean, like a lot of the times you'll find uh, families, you know, that have genetic diseases and stuff like yep. that. So like choices they didn't make, although there might be some yeah, okay. other stuff involved. Yeah. Um, be equitable. So, so then like you're going through life and you're already after having to spend X amount extra money on like meds and stuff like that yep. versus like um, wealthier that can afford it. So like okay. it's a bump maybe more for the lower classes. Okay, than it is got you. Upper. All right, man. So be, be more equitable in the way that we do things. Yeah, man. Who else? Wow. Any, who else has one? Yeah, go ahead. I think in the long run, it's more important to change the way you think about these issues and start the discussion earlier in life by uh -huh. changing like the curriculum of the elementary schools, middle schools, so you have that framework of choice versus chance early on and you can develop your own opinions with a lot of time. Like we, we're starting this discussion as 20 somethings with already formed life experiences. Okay. So just looking at different perspectives since you're young okay. helps you discover new solutions. to. Okay, problems. got it. So now what do you do? So start from a really young age looking at different perspectives, right? Yeah. Uh, I was talking to, um, it's a guy who consults with different high schools, like uh -huh. elite high schools internationally. And they are implementing these types of discussions and programs in like the elite high schools. So the people who are up there look down instead of having to help the people who are down there all the time. Wait, so people who are at elite high schools? Yeah, like people who are already up in yeah. the... So that they understand how they got there? Yeah, and how they have to give back. How they have to give back, okay. Voluntarily by including that discussion from early on. Okay, all right, I got you. So the idea is try to, so you're saying, hey, come up here to people who are up at this end of the ladder and yeah. have conversations with them about what's going on down there. So it's like y'all need to be paying more attention to what you have to give back to the community. Yeah, not only conversations, but like programs. Like programs. I, I went to a private school uh -huh. and we had to do like, what was it, like 40 hours of community service. Uh -huh. But that started in high school. So by the time I got there, it was more of a, all right, I got to get my 40 hours instead yeah. of actually caring. Like okay. Most people don't actually care what they're doing. They just have to get the 40 hours. Okay. All right. All right. Let me, all right. Let me ask this then. So one thing that I'm hearing a lot is people talking about individual decisions, which is not going to affect. Bro, can you, Jeff, can you go back to that slide, the third slide number three, probably one, that one right there. That's not going to, so this is cool, bro, right? This is good. But how are you going to affect that besides a full-scale revolution? Like, how are you going to affect that? Because I get, well, because what I'm here, one thing I'm hearing are some things. It's like, where do you go there? Dude, um, go ahead, man. Um, so one of the things that I think is really important, I think it boils down to, like, changing narratives. We talked about it with the, like, police brutality and stuff. At the end of the day, like what's going to end up changing all of this is having people who are different mind, like different minded, like conservative Republicans, whatever, or conservative Republicans and like liberal Democrats coming together and being able to like change policies to benefit everyone because there are certain um, like liberals like to think that they have all the right answers and conservatives like to think that they have all the right answers. And if you're both polarizing each other through different versions of media, like you're never actually going to come together and fix this. So okay, well, what, what do conservatives, can I then ask some conservatives, what do conservatives say about that? How do you fix that? Well, I think everyone generally would say that that's not right. But when you talk about like, I don't think people, I think people lose cause and effect of their actions. So like you can make an economic benefit that would economically benefit yourself if you're in a higher socioeconomic class, which we would assume that you would do. But what is the effect of that socio, like sociologically? Like what does that do okay. to okay. the Okay, racial no, gap in America. All right, but listen. No, I, okay, I hear that. What do conservatives say about fixing? How do you fix that if you're a conservative? Oh, I see bro, he's going to respond down there. But what do, you, what do you say if you're Are you a liberal, bro? Yeah. What do you say well, if you're yeah. a liberal? 
Well, I think like I'm. I mean, I wouldn't say like I am liberal. Yes. Okay, but, but that's just how do you fix that? Social issues. Um, for me, I would say that like I mean, I think that economics and like social issues there's a balance between the two and you need to be able to balance the two which is really hard but i would say that certain things along those lines i'm always a big advocate for like especially pennsylvania when we talk about like school systems i think it's really important to like funnel money into the education systems themselves so people like to talk about welfare for instance and how it's just like free giveaways but when you have those inner city schools using textbooks that are 20 years old giving like like giving taxpayer dollars that would go into education instead of sending it to my high school where I have kids driving Range Rovers to school. I don't like we don't need that. Like and if you people change the narratives in their head that like everyone who grew up All right. lower socioeconomic status All weren't right. drug lords or whatever. Then All right. OK, I got it. That's, that's right. Your response. Yeah. That's a good response. Yeah, it's, very, it's a thoughtful response. It's and it's not a response that's going to get us anywhere because dudes you you can put more money in schools for folks down there, and these folks are just going to always have better schools, and they're always going to give money to their kids. It doesn't even matter if they have better schools. They get out of the worst schools, and they're going to take care of their kids. Their kids, every one of their kids could be homeschooled. They could just sit at the pool and drink margaritas all day, starting at the age of 16. It doesn't effing matter. Like, so we're, we're still, at, even though your response, that's a really good response. It's, it's a smart response, you know? Bro, what do conservatives say? How are you going to fix that? Yeah, do you have the, wait, kid, did you, I thought, I thought we gave you a, damn it. Can you pass that down? Where's, where's the other mic? Can I? Katie, can I go ahead, man? All right, me personally, I would lower corporate income taxes and, and taxes on the wealthy. So wait, hang on. You would lower corporate income taxes? And taxes on the wealthy. And taxes on the wealthy? Yes. And then what would you do with the money? I mean, the... Well, you would lower the taxes. So, yeah. So okay. you got to think about it. The wealthy people are the people are, who are making the jobs. Yeah. When you have more people working, you have more people paying taxes. So the economy gets better and it'll fix itself. Sure. So you're saying one of the thing, one of a basic conservative idea is put more money in the hands of rich people, it's money that they can actually invest and build and build jobs and so on and so forth, right? Yes. That's the way to do it. And then the issue is they're going to create more jobs, but what we're seeing here, let me just throw in a uh, yes but idea into that, okay? So look, if we look at this over time, Jeff, if you can go, if we can go back, is it possible? Um, if we go back over time, remember, I, I think if we look at this, this is actually getting more and more unequal. So we are putting more money in the hands of rich people. We have been doing that for the past 40 years, and it's getting more unequal, and it's projected to be more unequal. This is projected to grow. So it's like I'm seeing here, for example, right, this is growing. The gap is growing more and more, and more and more money is going into the top 1%, which presumably are the people that are creating the most jobs. And so that doesn't seem to be the answer. That's the one that many people who identify as conservative are putting out there, but it doesn't seem to be the answer to me because it's not working in the way. Because if it was working, we wouldn't see this. We would see this be start. We'd see this difference between Hispanic people and black people shrinking, not growing, and it's just growing. So it's an I get that. So that but that's the idea. It's like put money in the hands of rich people and tell them to go create jobs with it. Okay. Yep. Somebody else? Yo, I have one. Dude. Um, so, so I don't agree with Sam on that, but individual decisions make a huge difference from the poor, whether you're poor or not. Okay. Um, the consensus on YouTube is just, it, it doesn't matter what society does or what anybody decides for you it's all what you as the individual do for yourself which is another conservative thought it's not how can the government help me it's how can i get myself out of the situation okay so here let me re let me res can i respond to that here bro let me respond to that here's the problem when i'm going to go back to my story in haiti so no matter what 
I've got, I've worked with so many really, really smart people in Haiti because we had an entrepreneurial program that we were doing with my friend Ernst Jean-Louis. Okay. It's his program, but we were supporting it. And I watched, I watched the most amazing things happen. And what we got were just with an influx of a little bit of money, poor Haitians, really poor Haitians could have get make create jobs for themselves and maybe a family member or two and just enough to pay their to bills to you know to to survive and but they're not getting rich doesn't matter right so they can make the best decisions the most amazing decisions and they're still living within the context of a poor sociological environment that is Haiti so it doesn't matter what decisions they make and so what I'm would what I would argue is it's basically when I see this these kinds of inequality that we're seeing unless we find a way to break the inequality in a huge way people can make all the individual decisions they want and they're not going to break it so we can just keep giving more money to rich people but it doesn't matter like they're going to all they're going to continue to stay on top so that's my thought on it even though individual decisions do like people all you can do is make a better decision like for me if i want to have more money tomorrow than i have today then mainly just figure out what decision i can make like i always paid for condoms I didn't want to have a kid, and I didn't want to spend money on a child, so I just always invested in condoms. That's just kind of how I lived my life. I did the calculations when I was 14 years old, and my girlfriend and I were get, deciding to start having sex. I'm like, how much is a kid? How much do condoms cost? I got my calculator out. I started to calculate. I'm like, oh, shit. Whoa. All right. I'll buy condoms. And then I would just go out and buy, I don't know, my mom started buying me condoms because she did the same calculations. It's like, oh, shit. All right. It's not rocket science sometimes, bro. So uh, I think something that we could potentially try to work on to start the ball rolling on the distribution of wealth would be to fix the patenting system. Um, fix the what? The patenting system. The patent system. Yeah. I didn't realize this until like a year ago that it's like, really broken. Um, it costs about, on average, like $20,000 just in legal fees to get your patent yep. on whatever it is. And then it costs even more money to uh, stop infringements. So, on that. so your idea is if people who had cool ideas, people who are down here at the bottom, yeah. who nonetheless have cool ideas and are like, hey man, I could like move forward with this cool idea and I could probably get my, not only myself out of, in a better situation, but people around me and Oh my God, I could create jobs too, as an example, right? Yeah. And they, but it costs too much money, so therefore, all right, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, and even if you do get it in there, like your patent, um, like small and medium companies can't really access that because only the big companies can really afford to uh, go after that and secure that patent from other people using it, like uh, making counterfeits and stuff like that. Yeah. So it wouldn't necessarily fix everything but it could get the ball rolling a little bit all right okay all right that's fair hey what do different religions say about this what are you saying your religions like dude what do you, what, what do you say dude because we're, we're nobody's getting at the structure of it in yeah. my mind yeah is it Karl Marx no 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 get me off the screen get all right screen. I got you me put me on the screen Go ahead, man. Go ahead, dog. What would you say? Um, I mean, I personally would advocate for radical international socialist armed revolution. But All right. I'm definitely a break out the guillotines kind of girl. Dude, right there. Yeah. Dude, it's the only thing. But yeah. the problem is when you have armed resolute revolution and you have violence, you're going to lead to more violence. Yes, which is why, I don't know, some people would say that's more of like an incrementalist approach, which I'm gonna, not going to lie, on the socialist spectrum, I do lean more towards incrementalism. Yeah. I feel like that's sort of like a last resort. But like, we're headed that way if things don't change. Yeah, well... So it's really in these rich people's best interest if they want to keep their heads attached to their bodies. In dude, order listen, to I, used to use, I used to use an, an article in this class called when the guy made the argument that they're coming 
they're going to be coming for us with their pitchforks. Oh, yeah. He was a guy from the 1%. Yeah. Talking to other people in the 1%. Yeah. And saying they're going to come at us with their pitchforks, y'all. We might yeah. as well do something And there's else. also this misconception that I heard from, where's the conservative guy? Where are you? There you are in your headphones. Yeah, you right there. See? No, 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 but he's just making, he just was saying what yeah, the but conservative like, a, argument was. I know, but there's a misconception within that conservative argument that, like, uh, the rich people and the people on top, the capitalist owner class, are the ones who create value. Yeah. And that's actually not true. Labor creates value. Before we had a capitalist system, before there was, like, a feudal system, yeah. there was, like, uh, agricultural societies, slave societies, yeah. labor has always created value. It's just the economic system which determines how that value is distributed. <laughs> so yeah, dude, you're wrong. That's no, bullshit. I, yeah, yeah. Listen, dude, don't feel, hang on. No, but that's not, that's not his idea, dude. Hang on, hang on. Dude, dude he didn't say that was his idea. He said that I asked for what the conservative argument was. Yeah. Okay, okay, I got you, all right. I, the conservative argument is wrong, not him, yeah. Look, in, let me just say another thing. Um, I find it really, dude, is she not the fucker? She's still here. All right, dude, you're the best. All right, look, the last time I had a Marxist in my class was like two, 1992. Uh, all right, at the top, yes. All right. So um, this isn't relating to religion, but kind of the concept of what we're talking about yep. and how the wealthy will always be, will always have the upper hand. But I think the question we're not asking is, um, you know, I don't think anybody wants to live in poverty, but some people want to be just comfortable in their lives. They yep. don't necessarily want to be a part of the upper class. Yep. So I think that's something else to be considered. Cool. Yep. Okay, cool. You know, cool. someone might be poor, but they might work a little harder and become more comfortable in their lives, and they yep. might be content with that, versus Mo someone who might be even still poor, but want to be in the upper class yep. and work even harder to get there. No, I got so I you. That's and, something and, to consider. Yep. Okay, that's cool. Good point. Most people really aren't trying to be at the top. Most people realize they're never going to make it to the top. They just want to have a little bit more than what they have. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Cool point. Yes, bro. Yeah. To like build off of what you're saying, I really agree with that because I think the problem right now is not that we have a bottom 20% and we have a top 20% and there's a big disparity. The problem is that the quality of life at the bottom 20% and the bottom 40% might be really bad. I think the issue, the, the reason for that is because we have a broken system. Uh, whether you look at areas of justice or healthcare or the I mean, it doesn't really matter. Education, it doesn't really matter. I mean, you can go to every sector and you'll find areas that are broken. And to truly fix those issues, I think you can, because we are in a capitalist system and we have a government and the government is the people that are making the laws, it's at the policy level that is really where the change is going to happen. And Okay, okay, so hang on, hang on. Yeah. So Leslie, listen up, y'all. This is actually, I want to hear what you think about this. Leslie, as far as, I asked, how are we going to radically change the system and find the solution, like a real solution, not like, yeah, we'll take a few poor people and tell them to go to school and study a little more, change their thinking. No, Leslie's the only one that has actually offered a solution that I see would be that. It's fucking revolution, man. That's the only thing that's going to make it happen. Otherwise, like when you have an idea that the top 1% are imposing this idea, like, oh, give us all the money because we'll create the jobs. I'm like, dude, that's like... Why don't you give me all your money? Why don't you give me all your weed? Got it? Those of you who got weed, why don't you give me all your weed and I'll just take care of it? Okay. You know yeah. what I mean? So he, he, I, I got it. I'll, so I'll work on that. Like, so you'd be like, nah, dude, come on. You're like a pothead. You're going to smoke it all. Like, yeah, well, rich people are also going to take all your money and spend it. So it's like it's just a question. So anyway, like, what do you do to fix the whole system? Right. Because okay. she's the only one that actually gave an answer. So I think a potential solution would be Right now, I think voting is what we can do. That, that's the overall answer. But when we're voting, we have to know who we're voting for. Because right now, if you look at the justice system, right, we have a bunch of corrupt judges that maybe like, are racist. But when you're voting for judges, in, you don't really look at 
who's getting voted in. You're, you okay, do listen, on, on, dude. Like, which judges Wait, I'm gonna, I'm going to disagree with you on one thing. Okay. There are a few corrupt judges. The vast majority of judges are just like the vast majority of the police. They're following the script. They're following procedures. They're really thoughtful people doing what the procedures tell them to do. And then things happen. Right. And who makes the procedures? The government. And there's somebody okay. in the government that's writing the procedures. So, so how do you break that down right besides a violent revolution, which I'm not arguing for. I'm just making the argument that she's the only one that said anything that sounds like it could have a change. Just a thought. How do you do that? That's like, bro. Um, <laughs> I'm going to take a little bit of a step back from the socialist uh, ideology and say universal basic income. Universal basic income. Yep. And then people at the top adjusted for income, how much you get per month. So okay. if you're not making any money, you get the maximum amount. If you're making enough that you're living comfortably, you get nothing. Mm-hmm. Okay, dude. Universal basic income. All right, got it? Yeah, bro. Dude. So, um, for the uh, distribution of wealth and the inequality there, something to think about is that if you make more than $35,000 a year, you are in the top 1% of earners in the world. So with that said, do you want like do the people in this class, most of us are slated to make more than $35,000 a year after they get out of college? Do you want a radical redistribution of wealth? Because if it's redistributed, do you want your $2,500 a year? Or do yeah, you want to make a salary that's unequal, but it's going to give you the life that you want? Yeah, exactly. Dude, beautiful point. Because, um, wait, what's your name again? Christina and Taylor from the other day who were at the bottom are still rich by global standards. Absolutely. So, like, all right, where do we go from there? Hey, by the way, I'm also, dude, cool point. Thanks for that. Here's my next thing. Why are, why am I not hearing anybody either? Um, first off, I'm, it's really interesting. We're not hearing from black people. And secondly, no one's talking about the race piece. What do you do about the race piece? Like, I'd really like to hear some white people throw that out. White people who all of our lives have been receiving affirmative action, reparations, we don't call it that, but it's reparations from having lost the slave system that worked really well for us, but then we set a system up where we would get reparations, meaning we would just keep like getting a disproportionate amount of money and keep getting wealthier. And that God forbid black people should talk about reparations because, oh, no, you can't talk about that. Reparations, that's like our domain, you know? So I'm, I'm just curious. I'm not hearing anybody go to the race piece in all of this either. That just seems like low-hanging fruit. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to point out, like, yes, you could be in the top 1% in the whole world, but the cost of living in a different country is a lot less. So while you could have $35,000 here, you could be living in, like, a shanty town versus if you go somewhere else, you're going to be living in a really nice house. So you can't really compare apples to oranges like that. Okay, you can't, but at the same time, having just got back from Haiti, where it's still, I can, the cost of a beer is a dollar in Haiti. Yeah. It's a dollar in the U.S. The cost of a cup of rice in Haiti is more expensive than a cup of rice in the U.S., right? So Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. You're, ri you're, you're right, essentially. And yet, for me to buy land in Haiti, for me, it's not that different from a lot of places in the United States, which is why people are so immensely poor. Right, and so I just look at. Well, I first off, I calculate everything by how much a beer costs, because that's my standard of pricing around the world. And so, not that I drink a lot of beer, it's just my standard of pricing. So, a cup of rice and a bottle of beer, and I'm like, damn, that's pretty serious. So, those two things right there are two dollars. And you want to know what the the basic income is in Haiti? The guaranteed bottom income is two dollars a day. That buys you a beer and a cup of rice. And from that, you've got to pay for your health care, you've got to pay for your kids, your kids' education, your home, your transportation, your house, everything. And that's it. So, so yes, you are right. And be, be really careful about that. Yes? I was actually going to uh, bring... I was trying to get someone's attention before you said that, right, cool. but... Um, I think because the reason for the racial disparity in income is um, white people have had a head start. And so from slavery, um, 
racism, Jim Crow, Jim Crow from the government, and therefore the government has con contributed to this income disparity, and therefore they should have to fix it with subsidies or um, reparations, affirmative action, and that's the only way that we can. Okay, so okay, so so this is the idea of reparations. Have, has everyone heard this term, reparations? So black people make this argument to say, look, we've never gotten any reparations from slavery, right? Like you, you know, you take everything, you take, you take, you take, you take, you ensure that we stay on the bottom, the vast majority of black people in the United States, and then we're going to stay down here. And, they, and if you don't like us being down here, if you feel like, hey, black people really need to, like, it'd be better if you sort of integrated. So two things you can do. One is stop discriminating. And two, give us the reparations that if we would have had back right after slavery, if we really would have offered 40 acres and a mule to every black family, which is what was this kind of different ideas. That wasn't the only one, but that was just the one that we talk about. If we would have done that, black people would not be disproportionately poor in the United States. It would be a completely different world, but it is. But then we turn around and we're just like, oh, yeah, fucking black people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't get it. Joe, so just do the reparations thing. So people make the argument today. Well, then do the reparations today. Just do it today. Just And that's the universal basic income that somebody said, right? Like you could do it that way because it's also for poor white people and stuff, right? So, yeah, all right. So you would say the reparations. White people begin in reparations. We don't call it that, but we get reparations. When we didn't give money to black people to build a level of equality, when we didn't give that money, we took all that money and that stayed in the white community. That's called reparations. It's not really, but it fucking is. We gave the South money to get the system back up and running again, to repair the system. And the way they did that was to re-enslave black people and create a situation and a condition called reconstruction that was worse for black people than slavery was. And if you don't understand that, you just never read about it. The situation for black people was worse because at least as a slave, in the United States, the average price of a slave in the U.S. in, in today's dollars is about $30,000 by the end of the Civil War. And $30,000, when you pay $30,000 for a slave, if I paid $30,000 for something today, like a car, trust me, I'm going to take care of it. And so, and there were basic laws in every state about ways in which you could and could not treat your slaves because your slave was property and the, the entire system depended on white and slave masters not being too violent. And so there were at least even some laws that you had to treat people with a decent level of respect. But after slavery, it's worth nothing. Black people were worth nothing. And so therefore, we created a completely different system that was so much worse. God. Uh, one more thing. Uh, yes. We also need more uh, people of color running for uh, pos positions of power in the political arena, specifically to push for policies as such. Wait, you mean like Obama, so you can ensure that more and more money went to the hands of the one percent, or you mean like, like what? No, I mean like more people who are. I mean more pe African American people who will help. Yeah. No, I got you. I know what you're saying. I'm going to go back to Leslie, though, right? I'm going to be like, yeah, what well, you got? You got a bunch of people that by the time they move into positions of power, they're like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm, I'm in the system. And I get rich from a system that is fundamentally rigged against some people. So, like, the black person who's in the system is just going to be playing with the system and doing, like, whatever. But I got you. So maybe more representation. Yeah. Dude, do you have a question? Oh, dude, all right, man. <laughs> Thankfully. All right. All right, so kudos to Leslie for uh, pointing out something, but I'm going to kind of tie this in with what she said and what everyone else is saying. So, like, all of you were talking about solutions that someone else is going to implement, all right? I'm here to, like, challenge all of you that, like, this is our problem, all right? Like, it, it takes all of us being involved in the one thing that ties all of us together, all of us from different states, all of us from different socioeconomic statuses, and that's the government, all right? 
All I'm saying is that if for any one of these solutions to work, and there's been some good ones yeah. said today, we need to be involved in that process. Because right now, the most involved people in that process are the ones making the rules, and they are also the ones that are at that top 20%, top 1% of the income. Dude, all right, I'll buy that. Do you have anything, bro? That's actually really, that's very cool. All right, next one, man. Who else has got it? Ready? Can you pass that down? Um, I think another problem that we have is that <clears throat> a lot of people that's talking about the solutions are white, no offense. And I know, that's what I'm saying. Go yep. ahead. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're white, and I just feel like if we really want to make a change, we have to do it by buying black and investing into black businesses and buying back our neighborhoods. Just black. as for just black, just black or black and brown? Uh, black and brown. Black All right. Because there's Hispanic neighborhoods that should be better. So you're saying that, okay, so hang on, let me be clear, and then you can keep going. So the idea is, look, if we have disproportionate numbers of people down here who are black and brown, one would be to, look, we have to, inv it's not just like reparations, right, so to speak, but it's, no, it's targeted investment in communities that are where we predominantly see disproportionate numbers of black and brown people and really because people will pull themselves up by their own bootstraps when they have the opportunities whether it's a patent like the brother in the front set or whatever it is or basic income or whatever the case is that's what yeah that's what i'm saying but i'm yeah. not saying that white people can't do anything which you can and you can use your your privilege to do something about it but also black people, we have to invest in black businesses and buy, black, buy back our neighborhoods in order to change things. Because if these white investors and these white people who have all this power keep investing into our neighborhoods and putting these, all these gentrification and all of these, like, I guess, like, what's the fine wine and spirits, alcohol businesses or whatever. Yeah, dude. Like, um, yeah. yeah. If they keep putting those things into the neighborhood, we will continue to stay low because we will continue to have drugs and violence and people okay. drinking themselves to death. So, but, so I'm going to push back on what you're saying. This is a common thing that I hear from black people, which is cool, right? It's like, look, white people, if, if white people, if what she says in any way sounds like foreign, then you're not listening. This is, I, this is the message I hear from black people in particular again and again and again, okay? So that's, and that's fine. But it still puts the onus on black people. And so it's like, all right, but hang on. But, but, but once again, our Russian spy in the front row, she's the only one who said, no, you got to destroy the system and start over. Because like, we're still just working on it. But the thing about destroying the system is that the black people, we're going to be, have to be the ones to destroy the system because y'all don't speak up enough. Y'all don't speak up enough when another another black kid dies. Y'all don't speak up enough when police is killing somebody. Y'all don't speak up enough. So yeah. it's always the black people talking about the problems. When we talk about the racism, when we talk about the things wrong with the government, it's always the black people in the room talking. It's never the white people in the room talking, if we're going to be honest. And I just feel like, personally, I don't know what can happen to change due to the fact that this has been we have generational setbacks for all of minority communities that they will not be able to get out of no matter what. I just feel like they won't be able to get out of because the white man has put himself at a level that we cannot attain. Okay. All right. So, and we know how that works because, because well, we watch, are you going to go? Because we also watch how when black and brown people rise up the ladder, they do the same thing that other wealthy people do. Look, it is interesting that when we start talking about solutions, I, when I when I hear us talk about solutions, I'm like, oh yeah, these are things that black and brown people say all the time, and white people like we all pretend like we don't want to hear it or whatever. I'm like, come on, man. So y'all are in the same boat. Unless you're at the top, you're in the same boat. So, yes, ma'am. In the case of a revolution, what about the people that just made it to the top are working so hard to get there? Yeah, well, and whatever. Then they you get just hurt. destroy the system. The yeah. black kid that just made it to getting out of college and working for his family. Dude, hang on. I'm not arguing for a revolution. I'm what I'm what I'm I'm making the I want to be clear about this so I don't go on record as being like, oh my God, the revolutionary at Penn State, right? But what I'm arguing for is when we put solutions out there, 
It's like all I'm hearing are these little tiny Band-Aid things. Well, we heard redistribute the entire tax bracket. Yeah, we could do that. That's pretty radical and revolutionary, actually. Without violence, we could just do that. But it's like, yeah, what do you do? Like, can you redistribute the tax bracket? The person who just made it and is doing really well, yeah, they're suddenly going to be paying a whole bunch of taxes that they didn't anticipate paying. Yes, somebody else. Yes, wait, hang on one second. Yeah, go ahead. Wait, it's you again? All right, go ahead. My name is Chance. All right. Um, I just wanted to add that Marcus Garvey believed that um, African Americans should go back to Africa, and I'm not opposed to that. Yeah, all right. Yeah, go ahead, Mo. Um, Another thing that I would... Wait, hang on, white people? Wait, she said she's not opposed to that. Yeah, I know. She doesn't agree with you, but I just want to recognize the complexity of all this. Yeah, go ahead, Mo. Um, another thing that I would argue... Wait, hang on, hang on, listen up. Another thing that I would argue is that um, we have... There's a lot of talk right now with, like, politics. Um, that That's the major thing, is that, like, this is only going to come from, like, politics, but there's no action. Um, so, like, people talking about, like, oh, yeah, we need to change this and that, but, like, our generation doesn't vote. We don't actually actively participate. Um, and that's so important that we... I guess, like, what the cameraman said um, is that, like... Government is what ties us together, um, and nothing's going to change if we don't actually use our power. Like, at, white people, use your power to support the black and brown people around you. Or, and, or poor white people, yeah, by the way. Yeah, exactly. Anyone that's disadvantaged. Like, if you have privilege, use it to support the people around you. And don't just, like, talk. Like, live the way that you speak. All right. So let me just, let me say this. That's, I think that's fair. Look, here's my take. Here's, I want, let me say something here really fast. My, my take on this is I, I, I don't know what the solution oh fuck man dude are you gonna go go ahead man hello okay um I agree with everybody here like the main idea is like we got the, our main problem in order to get our solutions to fix our government because we got to pick know who we are voting into office because they make our decision, they run our, how our lives are. That sometimes like we're like off low key, like they make like rules and laws that not the everyday person know if you're not into politics. And one thing is that I like to like, for one solution is like look into like our big corporations like companies because some companies are for like they're say like they're American based, they're sending off their profits and their caches overseas. Yeah. And for those taxes were supposed to be for us for the US to fix our like have our good housing, schooling, whatever whatnot, is going to be like tax less than some overseas companies like uh, overseas like Apple or Amazon where it's like they don't pay basic like not like the max like what they should pay for the US, they pay or less in Ireland. So say like it's eight percent over in Ireland. It's supposed to be 35 percent in the U.S., and then we choose to—they choose to do it less overseas instead of the United States. Okay, so here, but your family's from Haiti, right? Yes. Okay, so listen. Now I want to go with what the dude said in the, uh, dude, the one team guy. Yeah, what he said, which is, look, in the end, though, this is a global issue. We live in a global world. Where, you know, tonight 700 million people will go to bed hungry, okay? So, it's a lot of people. And so, when we think about, okay, we're going to fix this only here for the United States, we don't get anywhere if we don't think about fixing it around the world. And fixing it around the world would mean that maybe we're going to have to give some things up, all of us, a little bit. And what's that mean that we got to give up? Like, all of us, a little bit. You know what I mean? Just out of fairness. And maybe if that doesn't resonate... Maybe it's just because you haven't put your, we haven't put ourselves in a situation where we actually experience the life. Like I was listening on the BBC this morning. They were interviewing this woman who brought her dead child. So she's in Mozambique. And you know, the, the, because of the cyclone, there's three weeks of flooding. And she literally walked through mud and water for three weeks to get to a place where she could bury her child. And I'm like, and this is not changing. And I just listened to her talk about walking through the mud. And I've walked through mud that's like this deep. I, and I'm like, oh, my God. 
And then it's thought, like, what am I, what am I willing? What am I going to give up? What am I willing? What has to happen? So it's not, so it is about the U.S. And it's like, uh, it's even bigger than that. So, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, bro. Do you have? All right, go ahead, man. Ryan, he go said, ahead, man. <laughs> So I agree with mostly with what was said about reparations. Yes, that must be done because of the incredible wealth distribution that happened as a result of slavery. But I also realized, like, how did Asians get so wealthy recently? And it's through a great investment in education. So I think um, investment in education is paramount. Uh, technology is making education accessible to everyone. Harvard and Stanford just made a couple of their intro classes for free and online. Yeah. I think technology is going to be a big factor here. Um, yeah, that's all I got so far. Okay, dude, I got you. And recognize that not everybody can be rich. So we are also are talking about redistributing somehow. Bro. Yeah, I think we keep kind of talking about like a certain system or a certain way things happen is what's going to fix it. But I think it's important to like, recognize that the people behind all these systems, like the change might need to come more from like a moral revolution instead of like people being self-interested, thinking about what benefits them, and then everything will follow. I mean, okay, the reality I is one. people start with a self-interested motive. Okay, like, okay, I got one real fast. Hang on, can I, let me get the last minute. Like, for example, if people identify as Christians, actually followed the, Christ as the liberator of the poor and, if, and pursued that as opposed to, like, the, the wealth gospel, you know what I mean? Like, God wants everyone to be rich and have fucking private jets as opposed to, no, actually, God really wants you to look out for your people who are less than you. That might be a really cool place to start. Yeah, we still have two minutes. Dudes. Yeah. Bro, hang on. I got that. That's cool, man. Last comment. Dude. Um, I think the solution to the fact that we haven't developed a ton of valid solutions today is to read and become educated. Um, I think that this class alone, and I don't think you think this either, Sam, but this class alone is not enough to, for us to develop like actual solutions and developed opinions. I'm sure some of the solutions that were proposed today were very well thought out and um, very well supported, but I would encourage everyone in this class to just like be curious, like do your own reading, develop your own opinions on these facts, because the yeah. truth is that if the only like data you're using to support your um, logic is what we've learned in this class, although it does a great job of that, um, it's just outright not enough. So just be curious and read. All right, last comment. I, I don't expect anyone to, it's like learn any, just like think, just like popcorn ideas so what do you think. I think that, I, I'm with you on that. Yep, just take it and go. All right, y'all, I will see you on Tuesday, man. Don't just watch Fox or CNN or MSNBC. Get your mind to different creative outlets. Hey, and...